Today we're going to be looking at some of the new Moose capabilities that have emerged over the last few months. And what these capabilities allow us to do is take multiple different Moose-based multi-physics applications that solve some amount of nuclear physics. We can now take these different physics applications and actually have them talk to each other and couple them together to achieve more complex simulations, approaching the ability to model a full nuclear reactor all the way from the grain scale, the microstructure, all the way out to the whole piping network that surrounds a nuclear reactor. This first simulation that we're going to look at is on a small benchmark nuclear reactor core. And what we've done is we've modeled a quarter of the core, and that's what you see on the left side of your screen. The block on the left side of the screen is actually going to be showing the neutronic simulation as done by Rattlesnake. Rattlesnake is our high fidelity nuclear simulation tool for doing transport neutronics. Also involved in this simulation is a piping network, which is actually modeling all of the fluid flow through the entire reactor core and out to the heat exchangers. This is being accomplished by Relap7, which is a Moose-based simulation tool for doing piping networks like this, and specifically for looking at accident scenarios, although we won't be doing that today. In the piping network on the right, the water flows around those loops and goes through a heat exchanger where the water is cooled down and then flows back down towards the bottom of the reactor and re-enters the reactor core, where it's again reheated and the cycle continues. So we're actually going to be modeling the thermal hydraulics using Relap7, the neutronics using Rattlesnake, and then what's not pictured in this particular movie is that we're also going to be modeling each of the individual fuel elements within the reactor core. Those rods are actually going to be individually simulated by Bison, and we'll take a look at what's happening to the fuel here in just a moment. And so we're going to power the reactor up, and then the reactor is going to sit at a constant operating power for about a year and a half. Now on this movie, that doesn't look terribly interesting. Essentially, you can see the neutronics come up to power on the left-hand side, and you can see the water heat up and start flowing through the pipes like it's supposed to, but it basically just sits at a steady state at that point. What you're not seeing is all the complex machinery of what's happening inside the fuel as it burns up over a year and a half. What we're looking at now is the behavior of each of the individual fuel elements. On the top of the image, we can actually see the nuclear fuel itself. And we've removed the protective cladding, the steel tubing around the fuel, so that we can actually watch what happens to each of the individual fuel elements as they burn up over a year and a half in the reactor. Underneath that, through the cutaway, we can actually see the temperature of the coolant itself, the water as it flows through the reactor. And then on the bottom here, we can actually see the neutronics, the physics of the fissioning process itself. The fuel basically goes through three main periods in life. It's going to thermally expand initially as it heats up, and then there will be a period of densification as the fuel is under really high pressure and has a really high temperature. And then later on in life, as we reach out towards the end of this fuel cycle, fission products are building up inside of the reactor and are actually causing the fuel to swell once again and start to grow. Now, this is an exaggerated displacement. It actually moves quite a bit less than this. 